So there's a miracle sitting right up there. Mark Mitchell, we prayed and he's here. <laughs> so glad you're here, buddy. Good morning. And I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute, but um, in the context of what we have been addressing. I want to continue to talk about uh, what I've done in, through the month of January is, is we are continuing our stewardship journey, which we began three years ago. And um, I, I just want us to, to, to know that um, generally when we talk about stewardship, it, it tends to be very narrow. And I have to own... I have to own responsibility for that because it tends to be leadership that um, tends to reduce stewardship to our, our giving in terms of tithes and offerings. And stewardship from a biblical perspective is much, much, much broader than that. And, and so we've been on this stewardship journey and what we're talking about now is stewardship in terms of our service to Almighty God. And our journey, our stewardship journey, has uh, gone along the lines of the commitments that we have made to Almighty God in our membership vows. We're following the membership vows and looking at stewardship from that, that broad perspective. And so I wanted you to know that as we continue to address uh, stewardship in terms of our stewardship of time, our stewardship of service to Almighty God. And I want to thank you for those that have gotten a book. I hope you all have gotten a book and are reading along uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, first of all, because I, I know, and it's, this one I own, this is my, this is my problem, it's not your problem. Um, <clears throat> people will often say to me, well, I don't read. And, and I have to admit, I, I want to admit to you, I, I don't understand that. Um, I, I, I don't understand that. I don't know how we grow. I don't know how we function without reading, but that's my problem. I'm owning that, okay? So I hope that some of you who are there, who just don't read, you know, I do remember a point in my uh, teenage years when um, picking up a book was... Um, was like sticking a needle in my eye. I do remember there were days that I, I didn't read or didn't want to read, um, but I'm glad that I've been able to get past that. And, but, so I'm hopeful that, that, that you have picked this up, even if you're one of those who just, it's just not part of who you are. It's not, it tends to be where you're at, in, in part because of, of the, the incredible value, and I have seen incredible value in Mark Batterson and how he talks about prayer. And, and for me, honestly, and this person who, I really have studied this like every, everything else in terms of our faith life, looked at it. Um, it has, he lifts up prayer in a refreshing way, in a way that, that does not do damage to free will, but yet um, holds out and helps us understand how nonetheless God interacts with humanity intimately without disrupting free will because of the blessings that God has already promised for us but asks us, wants us to pray for those blessings. All right, so it doesn't disrupt free will. And he doesn't look at it magically. He, he, ans he does talk about there are issues of, of, of deep prayer that don't seem to work out the way we want them. He does, he does not go to some kind of magical or some kind of, oh, well, God knows better than we. He talks about, literally, there are times we just don't know just don't understand. It is beyond us. And, um, and so I, I think that's refreshing. Secondly, I think it is, is very, very important that a community that, that comes together might actually have a common body of knowledge, of, of literature, uh, uh, that we can work from. So that when we speak from out of that, we, we know already. We know what one another is talking about, and, and because I, I think it helps maybe create some dialogue, which, which sermon should be more of a dialogue than it is a lecture. And, and I know that, but I know who we are. I know where we come from. It's hard to create that dialogue in this setting, so the sermon becomes much more a lecture, which I think is not very helpful, 
Because what I've learned is, is that where we tend to learn as people is not in a large body like this, but we tend to, to learn in smaller groups where we have interaction back and forth, um, even under the instruction of a leader perhaps, but where I have learned, and the way I have learned more times than not, is, is that the instructor, who, who often tends to speak in language that is above us, and because they know so much, uh, speaks to the group, and someone in the group gets it, you, you see. Someone in a smaller group gets it, and is able to integrate it and then speak it in a way that makes sense to the rest of us. And that's the, the, the positive nature of, of dialogue that is based on some common uh, uh, interest and some common knowledge. And, and that's very, very hard in today's world because we are not um, people that, that, that you can speak of too well in terms of community anymore. There's, we're too individualized. Each individual here. And as soon as you say, let's do this, um, someone say, I want to do that. And the other one, I want to do this. I want to do this. And, and so it's very, very hard for us to work together. But when the church works together and when the church moves in a direction together, powerful things happen. God is able to accomplish powerful things. And so that's why uh, hopefully we're reading this together and hopefully we have this common body of knowledge. And hopefully if there is an issue, you will ask a question and I will do my best to answer that whether I know anything about it or not. Okay, uh, you're not listening. Hello? Yeah, we're here. Are you here? You're already thinking about that darn Steelers game, aren't you? <laughs> uh, uh, nobody said go, go. Who are they playing? Kansas City. Uh, we already know the Packers are going to lose because of who they're playing. But <laughs> I hope not. But hey, I'm sorry. I'm getting way off. Uh, and so... Um, I am hopeful that we can create more of that dialogue. And, and so I, I want to let you know a way that I think the Holy Spirit has always worked with me from, from, from fairly young is, is that I believe that this event that we're doing, that we think is our event, is not. This event is an event of the Holy Spirit. Worship is an event of the Holy Spirit. We tend not to talk about it that way. And who we are as a society, we tend not to think about it that way. We tend to think about me, I, what I'm doing, I'm this. But the, the Bible's clear that worship is an event of the Holy Spirit. It is the interaction of the Holy Spirit in, in and among us that moves us, that, that um, seats in our hearts the way we need that message. And so I remember even uh, before I was in the ministry, we would march in. I had, you know, I had four children, so um, we were good Methodists. I sat as far back as I could sit. Um, uh, they were kids. They were little kids. I didn't want to disrupt anything. But um, always in my life, in, in worship, open to the movement of the Holy Spirit, something the pastor would say, maybe a word, maybe just one word, maybe a phrase, w would click and I think, I really do, I think because God had an intention that I wasn't answering. God intended uh, me to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ. I, I would begin to preach that sermon based because um, the, the Spirit would seek that word and, and begin to blossom and grow. And, and so if that's happening, great, wonderful, because I believe it is evidence of the movement of the Holy Spirit that's speaking to us individually the way we need to be spoken to. Amen? Because we serve a God that's big enough. Do you believe that? Come on, speak up. Somebody. I mean that. We serve a God that is big enough to know us intimately. The Bible tells us that, by the way. To know us intimately. And, and to be able then to address us when and how and where we need that addressing. And so I pray that we, we allow ourselves that openness and that movement of the Holy Spirit. And so the same is true then, uh, still. Uh, and e even in reading, reading this book that we're reading together. And I was reading it, and I came across a chapter, Speak to the Mountain. Boom! Did that word, that phrase, jump off the page 
to any of you, speak to the mountain. Speak to the mountain. And this is what Batterson said on page 84 in speaking to the mountain. There comes a moment when you must quit talking to God about the mountain in your life and start talking to the mountain about your God. Wow. That might be, so far in what we've read, that might be the most powerful thing that he has said in this book. In fact, he is saying we have a tendency in our lives, and I, th I think if we're honest with ourselves, we'll see it's true. We have a tendency to allow the mountains to get in the way of God altogether. Actually, we speak about it oftentimes colloquially. We speak about people making uh, mountains out of anthills or mountains out of molehills, depending where you're from, uh, colloquialism, that, that we even have the tendency to allow very small things in life to get blown out of proportion so that they become mountains that get between us and our divine God. And our prayer life tends to speak to that because when we pray, we tend to go time and time and time again to, uh, to God uh, and, and talk about the problem in our life. Talk about the problem and talk about the problem in our life. What has happened is that, is, is, is that we have allowed the mountain, whatever that mountain is in our life, to take place in the foreground to such an extent that God is either out of you altogether, we can't see God because of the mountain. People often say, well, I've been praying about that and God's left me or I don't know where God is, whatever. It is evidence of the fact that the problem has become the mountain in the life. They can't see God in it or at the very least, the way that we see God is, is through the obscuring, dimming presence of the mountain so that we don't get a clear image of the divine God. We only get an image of the God as we can see that through the negativity of the issues in our lives. The mountain has become major. God has become minor. And Batterson suggests a helpful thing for us is to is to rather than pray to God about our problem, is begin to address the issue, the mountain, the problem, speaking to it about our God. Does that resonate at all? To begin to say about the health issue that is facing me, listen, cancer. I want to talk to you about my God. I want to talk to you about the God of the universe. I want to talk to you about the God that is not controlled by anything and not this cancer either. I want to talk to you about a, a family issues. Listen, <laughs> This is what I've learned over 30 years. It took me, I'm slow. It took me 30 years. If you have a family, you're going to have family problems. Right? It just is. But maybe, maybe we should stop going to God and just complaining to God and just asking God to do something about it and that in our prayer life we began to talk to that problem and we began to rehearse. It's, a, it's, it's reframing how we look at life, reframing how we live life, reframing how we understand God. It's to talk to the, the family problem about the divine God. Listen to you. I want you to know that you're really not that big of an issue because God is bigger than you. And what's happening when we do that is we are reframing and we are slowly, but we are inevitably and surely we're going to accomplish that. We are moving the mountain, the problem, the issue to the background and bringing God into the foreground. So that when we look at the problems in life, we look at the mountain at life, what we're actually doing is, is that we are actually looking through the presence of the divine God in the Holy Spirit, looking through the power of the God to the problem so that we can recognize that our God is bigger than any mountain in our life. Amen? Amen. 
but it means that we begin to change the framework of looking at the world so that we do bring God to that foreground. But if this is true in our emotional lives, and I think it is absolutely true, it is doubly true in our spiritual lives. Because here is a fact. It seems to be a fact anyway in terms of experience. Jesus' command to go into all the world making disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ is a mountain for most people. And I submit to you that it is not one of these smaller eastern mountains like the North Mountain out here, but going into the world making disciples in Jesus Christ is more like the Rockies. It's a big mountain. We see that and we don't see God behind it. Witness, actually witnessing, actually being willing to sit down with someone and witness to God's presence in our lives and what it has meant is not just right. It's the Himalayans, isn't it? It is bigger than the Rockies. It is so big that it so completely obscures God that we're convinced it's a mountain we cannot surmount. We cannot get there. Patterson suggests that what we do about this, witnessing, serving, uh, 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 making disciples, is that we bring God back into the foreground and we talk to God about that mountain. We pray to God and say, God, I have not, I'm not good speaking. I, I've heard that a lot. But that, that's been told to me. I wonder if you have told that to God. I wonder if you've gone to that problem of speech and said, listen, uh, I want you to know something. Your inability to talk, I want you to know something. That mountain that's in the way, I want you to know something. God's bigger than you. And listen, honestly, I, 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 I am a person who speaks out of utter truth and experience there as a person who could not stand in front of a group of people and talk. And you know what? Um, God got to me and said, I'm bigger than that. This is what you do about it. We need to reframe. We need to bring it, God into the foreground. We need to claim uh, 1 John 4, 4, the one in you is greater than the one who is in the world. We need to claim that. We need to begin to rehearse that. John, 1 John 4, 4, 1 John 4, 4, the one in you is bigger than the one in the world. Amen? The one in you... Who is the one in you? Jesus. Uh, the, the presence of the divine God, the one in you, is bigger than the one in the world. Anything in the world. A a amen? amen. It, but we're not claiming that. That's part of reframing, that we need to begin to rehearse that. And in rehearsing that, it helps us to bring God back into the foreground so that the mountain begins to be obscured by the presence of the Holy Spirit and the action of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because the Bible says this about us. We are more than conquerors. Not just conquerors. Or, or, or we haven't uh, been, been set up to, to be failures. The Bible says we are more than conquerors. In fact, the Bible says that God has so equipped us, God's presence is so with us, that if we choose to do it, we can march to the very gates of hell and prevail. But it has something to do with our inability to get the mountains in our lives out of the way so that we can see the divine God. When he came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples but they could not heal him. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there. And it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Now, <clears throat> I have to, I want to say of this passage, I know that there has been a uh, great scholarly debate on what Jesus means by this passage. 
And it really comes down, uh, this debate comes down to this. When Jesus was talking about that, was he talking about pure faith with no personal involvement in the act at all? Um, purely, all, almost magical, if you will. That if you simply have enough faith and you pray out of that faith, you can literally say, um, move mountain, and it moves. But if that is the case, here is an issue that we must address. There has never been a person on the face of the earth who had enough faith to move the mountain. If there had been, we would be reading about it, wouldn't we? I don't know a person who has enough faith to move a spoon from one end of the table to the next end of the table. The passage has, has the ability to be so daunting that we don't work on our faith life at all. Because I'll tell you, I remember the first time. I remember the first time I prayed, and I prayed that God would move a mountain. I remember praying for my grandmother, who had come to live with us, and lived with us for, I, I think it was about 10 years. And she got cancer of the abdomen. And I remember praying with every ounce of energy I had, every sinew in me. I remember praying out of the greater innocence, if you will, of, of being a young person. I remember praying and believing the Bible that said, if you pray, um, the, God will give this to you, and it will happen, and she will live. And I prayed for her to be spared. I prayed for her to live, and she died of cancer. And the only message I got out of that is, lo and behold, I will never be a person of deep enough faith to move mountains. Uh, it, I can't do it. It's not in me. But I don't think Jesus gave us this message to show us how, in fact, none of us can live into it. Or was he talking about pure faith in terms of that faith that believes in it, but it also includes personal involvement? Because in the scholarly debate, there are many scholars who suggest that, that Jesus was actually looking at something very particular and specific when he spoke of this passage. And that was that when you were in Jerusalem, and I've, I'm, I hope you can go. I've had the opportunity to go. When you're in Jerusalem, you can look down across the valley. I forget which direction, but you can look out there. It's, it's close enough to see. Far away, but close enough to see. You will see a mountain that, that comes up like a mountain about halfway and, and flattens out just as flat as can be. It's flat across the top of that mountain, nothing on top of it. And right next to it, you will see the top of the mountain a cone, the top cone of the mountain, that comes up so that the point of the cone is about even with the flat part of the mountain. And we know this. We know that what happened was is that Herod, the Herod, of, the terrible Herod that we speak to, but, but people who study history know that this terrible Herod was, is also known as an incredible builder. He was an incredible, he built incredible things. And one of the things he built was a fortress underground. Only the way he built it was is he built a fortress. And then he had his workers uh, take the mountaintop down and carry the mountaintop and pour it on top of the fortress. So that when you look at the top of the mountain sitting right beside the base of the mountain, it is setting on a fortress that Herod built. And, and what scholars suggest about faith is this. Because Jesus does not talk about faith in some magical form either. What Jesus seems to be saying to them is if you believe and you pray to God like you believe that this can be accomplished, then you can do what Herod did. You can move a mountain and say to it, you there, get here. And I like that because it's right in line with Batterson who reminds us in our faith life, excuse me, reminds us in our service to Almighty God who reminds us that it is imperative that we pray uh, bold prayers. We pray massive prayers. We pray prayers, uh, that, that, that in prayers in such a way that we know the prayer, it really relies entirely on God. And then we get up and we act and we work for it as if it depends entirely on us. That's the connection. That's the connection between faith and free will. That's, that's how we put this stuff into action. And so I believe that that's what Jesus is saying. Um, Herod had this. He first dreamed about it. He dreamed about the possibility. 
He believed he could do it. And then he began to act in a way that accomplished that which he believed. And, and that's what Batterson means when we talk about who we are as people of faith and our, and our service to Almighty God is, first of all, we pray about it, we dream about it, and then we begin to work for it as if it depends uh, totally on us. And I believe people have moved mountains for ages. I believe we have. I believe people of, of faith have moved mountains for ages. I, I believe polio, for instance, is one of those. Uh, uh, someone... Someone at some point, when it was such a dreaded disease, someone believed that they could conquer this thing. Do, do, you, do you realize that? Before they knew how to do it, someone believed it could be done. And I know, because in the Church of Jesus Christ, I know that people of, of goodwill and people of faith everywhere pray desperately for that. But the interesting thing about it is, is that the people who, who began to conceive of that began to work over against evidence at the time that it could be done, began to work as if it could be done, and, and they moved mountains. But that's happened, that's happened all over the place. I believe some of you have moved mountains. I do. I believe some of you uh, saw this thing that was in front of you that needed to be conquered, and you prayed to God about it, but you got up and worked for it too and moved a mountain in your own life. But the question remains, and I think we really need to be serious about that. For many more people, um, mountains have gotten in the way of their service to Almighty God. And listen, they don't have to be big mountains. I've talked about some big mountains. But the truth of the matter is, is they tend to be much smaller mountains. Mountains that we've made out of molehills. Uh, belief, for instance, that we can't witness about who we are. We've allowed that to become such an incredible mountain, we can't see God on the other side of it. And, and, and we can't believe then the power of this mighty God can in fact conquer that mountain, help us conquer that mountain. Small things become massive things in our life. Some, for some people, it might be faith itself. And I, I believe that's true, by the way. Looking at the way the world unfolds and, 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 and really being a person who has grown up in a church and sees that oftentimes the world doesn't seem to unfold the way that our faith has told us. And so faith itself becomes a mountain that's insurmountable. We can't see God, and so we walk away from the divine God. But Batterson tells us that the issue for us, that might be something about our failure to pray and recognize that faith itself is a gift of the divine God. He references the man whose son was healed, and Jesus says to him, Do you believe? I believe, Lord. What does he say following that? Somebody said it. Help my unbelief. Or probably a better translation, I trust, Lord. Help my inability to trust, to pray, to reframe it, to get God on this side of that mountain so that we see God, not the mountain. And we allow God into the place where God makes a difference in our lives. But if we do, we need to recognize that God is the Lord of surprises. And I, I would encourage you, don't just take my word on this, I would encourage you, go, go, read the Bible. Time and time and time again, when God shows up, it surprises everybody. In fact, it always does. We, we seem to want stuff done in a way that doesn't surprise us, but the evidence of the Bible is this. Every time God clearly shows up, it surprises everybody. And we then, if are praying for God to, to uh, cause us to be able to live into our commitments, to cause us to be people who can uh, serve God in a way that makes a difference in this world, we need to be prepared for the surprises so that when they come, we don't, we don't run from the surprise. Because we really do like things the way we like them. We want them to fold the way we want them to fold. We want them to, to come the way that makes the most sense to us. But God doesn't act that way. The Bible is clear. It always surprises us. We need to be ready for surprises if we believe that God is working in our lives. But then again, I'm going to come back to Batterson, who points out about James 4.2. He says, one of the problems with this, if our, we don't have a ministry error, our service is weak, we can't point to uh, how we have won a soul to the Lord Jesus Christ. It might say something about the fact that we are simply just not praying for it. We're not asking for it. So your ministry is weak, not praying about it. Faith is weak, not praying about it. Service is weak, not praying about it. 
not praying, uh, at least in line with how Batterson says, not speaking to that which is in your way about the divine God, not speaking to the issue that's in front of you about the power and the wonder of the God of all creation, but allowing the problem to obscure the vision of, of the divine God. I like where Battison talks about the best defense is a good offense, and it has to do with that because I think I love football, <laughs> where they talk about this more. But I remember years and years and years ago, there was a discussion, all these people, it was when John Madden, so those of you who know football know I'm talking a while ago, and John Madden was one of the commentators, and they were talking, going on and on and on about defense. Defense wins the games. Defense is what wins the games, always wins the game. And Madden came up and said, you know what, I've always found out the best defense is a good offense. And I believe that today. I do not believe you and I have been called into the church to be in a defensive posture. That's not why God put us here. He didn't put us here to defend the past, and so much of our time has been spent on defending the past. He didn't put us here to defend the past. He put us here to be in an offensive posture in the world. But the only way we can take that offensive posture in the world, move forward, is when we get the mountain out of the foreground and get it into the background and get God into the foreground. And then, lo and behold, we are able to move into the world in that, in that positive, offensive way. I mean, off offensive. How's the right word to say that? I don't want to be offensive. Offensive. Thank you. No, we're not to be offensive. <laughs> uh, I believe that. Um, we are to be positively moving into the world, and we do that only when we get God in the right frame. Amen? And then, I'm going to end on this. Um, he talks about if history. And I really like this. And I like it because um, for some reason, and I don't know why, I've always been a person who plays if history. Now, I, now I'm, I, I think I'm the only one who's ever done that. We tend to think that way. How many of you play if history? How many of you like toying with if history? Okay, maybe I am the only one. Oh, there's a couple. All right. <laughs> I really do. I, I, I really do. Uh, recently, I've spent a lot of time reading about the, the Revolutionary War, for instance, and some amazing things have happened that, that I find hard saying it is for no other reason than God was there. I mean, just if you, there's some amazing things. Hurricane showing up when it needed to. A storm blowing ships when it needed to. Fog covering the army when it needed to to save them. I think they're, uh, and, but I play if history. What if that hadn't happened? What if the army didn't move where they needed to move? What if Washington didn't cross the Delaware? What if? I played that with World War II. I, I play that, and it's an intellectual exercise for me, but Batterson says, we need to consider this. What if the Israelite community marched around the city wall a couple times and stopped? What would have happened in Jericho? If you know the story of Elijah, who at the end, to bring an end to a drought, what if up on the top of the mountain, he prayed one time, and it didn't rain, and he, he, he just left off. We know the story. He prays. He sends his servant. What do you see? Nothing. He prays again. What do you see? Nothing. He prays again. What do you see? Nothing. What if he stopped right there? He prays again. What do you see? Oh, man, a, some, a little cloud. Looks kind of like a hand coming up. He prayed again. What do you see? There's a cloud out there. What if he gave up? doesn't give up. He prays and the drought ends. I've asked a question. I've asked, you've heard me ask a number of times. What if Moses, and this is a big one for us, I think. What if Moses heard the call, answered the call, started down toward Egypt, but you know what happens to you and happens to me when we begin heading toward something really big, something massive, something bigger than us, something that we worry about every step you take. You get a little bead of sweat coming down. You you're, you're get a little bit tight in the chest. You, you, you start to second guess yourself. It's where God wants me to go. What if he allowed that to become a mountain and he turned back? What if? 
What great miracle? What great act? What service? What soul? has not been saved because you turned back. The mountain got too big, lost sight of God.